Bonsoir. Good evening. We'll get started. Kwe, Pijashig. Hello, bonjour. My name is Catherine Sinclair, Deputy Director, Chief Curator at the Ottawa Art Gallery, and I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Before we begin, I would just like to acknowledge that the Ottawa Art Gallery operates on the beautiful Anishinaabe Aki. The Anishinaabe have been on this territory, known today as the City of Ottawa, since the beginning of time. All sorts of art forms have been, continue, and will continue to be part of the vibrant Anishinaabe culture. And so today, we're pleased to welcome you to our program with Leslie Reed. One of two artists in the exhibition Dark Ice, Leslie Reed and Robert Kautuk, now on view here at the Ottawa Art Gallery. Their exhibition was thoughtfully curated by OAG's curator, Rebecca Bassiano, and thank you, Rebecca, for all your work in bringing these artists together. As you all know, the exhibition demonstrates the intersection between the unique artistic studio and land-based practices of Leslie and Robert Kautuk of Kangatugapik, Clyde River, Nunavut. This talk is one of a few initiatives let, tied to this important exhibition. The, the initiatives include a wonderful virtual dialogue between the artists that was moderated by Dr. Heather Igloliote, undertaken in partnership with the Inuit Futures Program at Concordia University. You can find this online on the OAG's YouTube channel. And the conversation was also transcribed and included in the beautiful exhibition catalog that we have for the, ex for the show. And uh, I would encourage you to check out the shop is open till 9 p.m. tonight and it's available for purchase there as well as online. So uh, as a publicly funded institution, I'd also like to just thank uh, our core funders for a moment, the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council and the City of Ottawa. And it's especially uh, in relation to this exhibition, we are also indebted to our sponsors, which include Canadian North, as well as the McLean Foundation. So I'll just take a quick moment to uh, talk about a few logistics of this evening's program. Following Lef Leslie's talk, which will um, uh, last for about 40 minutes, um, you're invited to join us across the hall in Spencerville Gallery in the Dark Ice exhibition. So we'll exit through these doors at the end of the talk. I'll come back and remind you where to go. Um, where Leslie will continue her talk in a more informal setting, walk through, walking through the exhibition. And just a quick note that this portion will not be miked, and so just sort of getting there and, and uh, staying close to Leslie so you can hear, um, as well as just that's the opportunity to ask questions and just have a good conversation about what you've heard. Um, so please note that the portion uh, of this uh, present, the, this portion of the presentation will um, be live streamed to the OAG's Facebook page, where it will also be kept for future access. So I encourage you to make yourself comfortable, and if you need to exit or get up um, and stretch during the program, please feel free to do so. And so now on with the program. So we're so privileged to have an artist of the caliber of Leslie Reed here in our very own city. She's one of Ottawa's most esteemed and established practitioners with a national and international reputation. Her many decades of work here have contributed greatly to the profile of this city, proving that Ottawa is a place where an artist can grow a serious and respectable career. From the landmark exhibition, Some Canadian Women Artists at the National Gallery in 1975, along with representing Canada at the Paris Biennial, and among many other accolades, she will now tell us so much more in her words. And so without further ado, I would like to invite Leslie Reed to the podium. Thank you very much, Catherine. All I have to do is live up to that now. <laughs> so, um, I would also like to acknowledge that we are gathered here this evening on the unceded and unsurrendered lands of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg peoples, for whom we are very grateful and deeply indebted. I've been working in Ottawa and region for many years, and thank the Ottawa Art Gallery for inviting me to give this talk and the many friends and colleagues from over the years who have gathered here tonight. Um, now, I have to be careful that I hit the right buttons. I put this up so there are no surprises this evening about what you'll see. I know Catherine just mentioned the 1975 exhibition. 
And I'm so honored that the designer of that catalog, Iko Amari, is here with us tonight. Uh, great thrill to see her after all this time. And uh, so it doesn't look too much like an obituary of a much younger person. I put the word <laughs> artwork in front of it. <laughs> and I'm still very much alive. <laughs> so here we go. The Ottawa Art Gallery, and I'm going to read because of poor memory, asked me to talk about the full arc of my work and career, culminating here with Dark Ice, of which Cassie mentioned, which is in collaboration with Robert Kautuk of Gangitabakik, Kangit Gapik, Clyde River, Nunavut, curated by the generous and very hardworking Rebecca Bassiano. When Inuk curator, art historian, and professor Igloniorti, Heather Igloniorti, who Catherine mentioned, was in dialogue with Robert and me for the Dark Ice catalog and for Inuit Futures, it's called Frozen in Time, which is being launched on YouTube today, her first question to each of us asked, how we got into our artistic practice? It was a very big question. But we also both said, well, it's the story of a lifetime. So that's what I'm here to, uh, to give. I'm responding to the request of the gallery and answer, answering Heather's question, perhaps a bit literally. I've gone back over my life as an artist, both physically and emotionally. It will be a very personal journey in pictures. I went back to my beginnings as a naive but determined young artist, recalling the moment and place that created an intense desire to explore the sensations triggered there. That beginning is in the paintings of Calumet Island, created in 1975 for the National Gallery exhibition, uh, Some Canadian Women Artists, just curated by Mayo Graham in celebration of the first International Women's Year, which has now become International Women's Day. Some of these works are also included in the much more recent retrospective, Leslie Reed, A Darkening Vision, curated by Diana Nemiroff in 2011 for the Carleton University Art Gallery. And I think Diana's here tonight. <laughs> this image is an installation shot from A Darkening Vision. The original exhibition was in the old National Gallery's Lauren Building. I don't know who remembers that, some of you. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> which had such low ceilings that the works could not be photographed there. So it's a good thing they were photographed at Carleton. Here you see the large Canyon Island painting now in the National Gallery collection. On the left are two subsequent paintings, Dargy 2 and 4, which were shown in the Biennale de Paris in 1977. And on the right, the then very new painting of Cape Pine, Newfoundland. This is Darji 4, which is now in the Ottawa Art Collection, uh, a gift from the collection of Diana Nemiroff. Looking back, I wonder where that determination to create these large paintings, at first glance abstract and minimal, and where that inspiration came from. But they are the closest I came to distilling the light and shimmering horizon of the river and shore of Calumet Island. And it sprung from a moment of recognition on Calumet or the island as I knew it. I was seeing it on my return to Ottawa after years away at art school in England, where new friends who had come camp said, come camping with us on our magical island. No one knows about it. Ha, huh, well, except me. I was, it was the site of my maternal grandmother's birthplace and home and up the Pontiac, where from infancy to the age of six, I camped with grandparents, my mother and relatives under canvas all summer long on the banks of the Ottawa River while my father was away flying in the north. The memories, the light and space, textures and scents were all still there decades later. In the paintings of the island, I concentrated on the perceptual and psychological effects of shifting light aroused by that experience of a place, though I might not have known that at the time. My long fascination and work with this region, though, began there. That digging into the remnants of a place has stayed with me as I've sought out sites in various parts of the world, the unremarked, unoverlooked places that fill with life when closely observed, and water, sky, fields, and trees became a constant source. Over the years, I came to realize that what drew me to certain sites 
where the traces and fragments of lives lived there, whether recently or over time. This painting, I have it here, a selection of works that evolved from 1977 to 1983. This one is Popham One, which is from 1978. It's a beach in Maine where I used to live, and uh, the water is incredibly cold, so I'm surprised there's that many people in the water. Uh, I painted the California and Maine coastlands, went back to England and its trees and hedgerows, and onto the Var in Provence, where I spent several weeks photographing the light and space of vineyards and fields, creating the paintings at the Cité des Arts in Paris, where I had a Canada Council studio, studio and continuing back here in Ottawa. This painting is the Pontiac, painted in 1980. It's a solitary tree on the floodplains of the Ottawa River along Highway 148. It's in the collection of the Musée d'Art Contemporain Montreal and was shown there just before COVID hit and closed everything. This is from the Var as well, Var 6 Vlaasque, where I was staying, 1981. It's the vineyards that I walked by and hitchhiked by uh, in my weeks there. This is, sorry, this is Les Valises. This is Flayosk, which is where I was staying. And I was very aware of the light and shadows in the bushes that I was recording there. Uh, these, this work and the previous ones were, sh the so series of the VAR was shown in a solo exhibition at the Centre Culturel Canadien in Paris and in Canada House London, uh, which happened during the year I was living there. This is Water Ditch One in Dorset, England. It's an image that echoes a favorite drawing of mine by Leonardo. So I see Leonardo every time I see an image of this painting. This is Jeunesse Rue, which is a rather scruffy low cliff on the shore of Bay Saint-Michel that was known to the painter Edgar Degas. I'm going to go back here and just leave that up for a moment. Uh, this was also in the darkening uh, uh, vision catalog. On my return to Ottawa from Paris in 1980, though, my life changed dramatically. I got married and had two sons. My intention and determination was that this would not change my art practice. And so, for a survey of exhibition Landscape into Light, 1974 and 1990, curated for the then Auto Gallery at Arts Court, which has now become the Ottawa Art Gallery, by Anna Babinska, I began a new series of dark cold wax paintings. I was now looking for those lived places in the shadows, slowly revealing the light there. The first of these paintings is Denny Wood One, which is in the New Forest, England, where we hiked and cycled with the children on visits to my English husband's hometown. Denny Wood One is now in the Carlton uh, Kuwait collection. One of those places was the former beaver, now swimming pond at Candley, where our sons played endlessly, much as I spent my childhood summers by the Otto River in Calumet Island. This is Cantley II, 1990. Here's that pond in the center uh, with the uh, growth reflected in the water. <coughs> and this is, um, it's empty of children, even though they had been swimming in it. This is when it's in the Art Bank collection. This is Cantley IV. It's a, shadowy image of the lane into the Cantley farm. These are all places I shared with my family and where I'd photographed them for several years. And I'd erased their presence in the paintings I did from those photographs. It struck me like a blow. I was eliminating the center of my life, my children. So I dove into the world of art and motherhood, which I'd been told was not serious or even possible for an artist especially not for a woman artist. But I became a fervent researcher on art and motherhood for many years. In my paintings and in speaking at conferences and writing articles on motherhood, the making of art, and how it all played out in my work. My children were now in my paintings, 
I was still the invisible presence in the works, but I was no longer absent. This is one of the first paintings that shows my two sons flashing in an inner tube and the light and shadow of the pond, which is now in the QAG collection. This is one of the, ver the very beginnings of the work with my sons. This is, hmm, I seem to have missed one here, sorry. This one is what, the one I want. Um, this is Cantley 14, 1995, in the inner tube again, but they are precariously perched this time, so concentrating on the lines they are untangling that they don't realize they might fall over at any time, but I could see it. And they both could swim. So it's hard to see these arrows in the dark. I'm looking at the bright lights. This is Cantley Spiral. My older son doubled in the shadows and light of the backlit pond. Cantley, it's in a valley, so we get a lot of this kind of light. This is Cantley Wings. My younger son in shadow, also backlit in the pond. Some of these paintings were first shown in Surfacing, curated by Sandra Dick at QAG in 1996, where for the first time I showed the original photos with the paintings. And Sandra wrote a wonderful essay on these first works on motherhood. And here is this one. Some were shown in the 2011 QAG retrospective. I worked with family image, images until my sons grew older. This painting, Calumet Ellipse, shows my younger son and a friend swimming in the fast moving current of the Ottawa River. And it's the last of the series done in 2010. So the series of working with the children was started in 1993 and ended here. In 2007, I retired from the Department of Visual Arts at the University of Ottawa after 36 years of teaching. I knew it was time to go north. The desire had long been there from my early awareness. I'm just going to go back, actually, for a moment. Um, the desire had been there from my early awareness of my father's stories and the vivid memory of the polar bear skin he had brought back. I remembered the sensation of playing and napping on that bearskin, often twisting my fingers in the hole in its head, with the bullet hole, I was told. I'd started thinking about the Arctic even while working with the light of the VAR in 1980, but nothing was realized as I re returned home from France to be acting chair of the visual arts department and to marriage and motherhood. I was very busy and the North retreated further and further away. Then, just before my retirement, I was invited to join a group of graduate students in glaciology at the University of Ottawa on a field trip to the Kluane ice fields in the Yukon. I was ecstatic until the group was overbooked and I was bumped. <laughs> a little aside here, it all worked out in the end. I did get to join them at last, but not till this past summer in the ice fields. It will be the next series of works. Took a while. And then I got the serendipitous invitation from Mary Pratt to stay at the Cape Pine Lighthouse, isolated on the edge of a cliff at the southernmost edge of Newfoundland. It now belongs to her son, Ned. When I arrived, the fog was incredibly thick and I could see almost nothing, especially not the cliff edge nor the Atlantic. For several days, I used all my senses to find my way safely in the fog. I used the short visual distance of the fog moving ahead of me as I walked, the feel of gravel beneath my feet, and the sound of the foghorn, counting the intervals to estimate the distance I had walked on the gravel road away from the cliff. This very immersive experience would become the Cape Pine series painted for the exhibition Leslie Reed, The Darkening Vision uh, at uh, QAG. So here we are with this painting. These are three paintings referencing the fog I just described on my arrival at Cape Pine. There's on, the, uh, on your left, Cape Pine the Cairn, in the center, Cape Pine the Road, and on the right, Cape, Pound, Cape Pine the Station, which is from the official name of what the fog alarm station is. These are all called stations, the light station and the fog alarm station. So I took the proper name. Uh, two are at the National Gallery and one is at the AGO. 
I'd recently been invited by Diana Nemiroff to have this retrospective at QAG. It was a timely and inspiring invitation, and I was thrilled. Diana also wrote a very insightful essay for the catalog of the retrospective, which is available here in the bookstore. This is Cape Pine, the Barrens from 2013, which shows what actually could be seen on the ground through the fog. And the, the remnants, this was late August, early, no, it was late September. And this is just the remnants of what's there seen through fog. But I'd still, oh, okay, sorry, skipping ahead here. This is Cape Pine, the station, their video stills. I did one of my first videos called Cape Pine the Station, a slow walk in the fog to the fog alarm station, which finally appears in this selection of stills. The cliff is just behind. So if I'd actually kept walking in the fog, I might have just slid down and away, and not be here today. But I'd still not gone north. I'd heard of Canadian Forces Artist Program, CFAP, and thought it had been closed down. However, in 2011, I learned it had been revived with applications only every two years, and the deadline was a week away. I needed a proposal that had a link to the military, and uh, John McFarlane, who organizes that, is in the audience tonight. Thank you, John. <laughs> My father had been an RCAF fighter pilot, and at the end of World War II, he remained in the military. My long childhood summers spent camping at Canyamet were due to my father being sent north for months at a time over years to fly photographers taking aerial images for the first accurate mapping of the north. It was the start of the Cold War. My father would return home after months of flying full of his attraction and love of the north. And there was also that polar bear skin I mentioned earlier. I applied for CPAP proposing a residency focused on climate change, a growing concern for me, and based on my father's long trips north. I asked to be flown over some of the areas he had flown for mapping. They had covered hundreds of thousands of miles, taking hundreds of thousands of photographs, all processed here at Rockcliffe Air Station photo establishment. The photos are now archived in the marvelous National Air Photo library with its six million plus collection of images where I was able to research those early mapping photos. I could not turn to my father for information for he had died long ago aged 44 and we were not close. He was both charismatic, fearless and angry sometimes violently and I'm still fearful. Some have viewed my Arctic work as seeking a closeness to him and one of the Canadian Rangers, the indigenous military reservists in the north, I met at their camp near Whitehorse and said, you are honoring your father. I have often thought about his words and perhaps in a way I was, but I work as I do slowly and ever watchful as a way to both deal with and quell lifelong fear and panic, much also starting with a traumatic birth. I put a proposal together through recalling names of places he would talk about and through the contact prints of the NAPL. I asked to be flown over northern areas to take my own photos and look for aerial evidence of climate change, not measurements and statistical graphs and tables, but what the eye could actually see in, a, in photographs taken 65 years apart. The dark ice light boxes grew from this. This is called By Land, Sea and Air. It's a projection of both NAPL archival photographs juxtaposed with my photographs from the Yukon, Northwest Territories, Nunavut, and Svalbard. It's in, in the exhibition next door. My CPAP residency took me to Whitehorse, to Kaskawalsh and Llewellyn Glaciers, to Yellowknife, to Resolute, and to Haluit, flying daily in helicopters, twin otters, Hercules transport aircraft, as well as experiencing ground activities with Op Nanook, their sovereignty operations then held every August across the North and High Arctic. I took thousands of photos, often leaning out the open door of the helicopters. I was amazed and thrilled that the military let me do that. You didn't hear this. 
Fearless, I was trying to replicate the vertical photos taken by the photo squadrons and got very close. Their photical, vertical photos were taken from a hole cut into the bottom of the aircraft, so nobody had to lean out. The CFAP experience was extraordinary, taking me beyond what I had tentatively and in great ignorance proposed to them. I came back to Ottawa with, with all those photos, some of which are seen here in by land, sea, and air. I did several paintings from that CFAP trip, most from my aerial photos of glaciers and referencing mapping and climate. Some of these works were shown in 2015 in Montreal and then in 2016 in a major solo exhibition called Mapping a Cold War held at the Founders Gallery Military Museums in Calgary. I put together a, a small catalogue of the show which is also available here. These are four of my photographs, aerial photographs, which I used for paintings. Uh, they, these are mostly of the Cascoal uh, Glacier River system in the Yukon, which I got to see again this summer. And these are the paintings I did from uh, the photographs of that, of that trip. This is the Llewellyn Glacier, which I'd mentioned. This is the glacier terminus, where I'm nose to nose with the terminus in a helicopter flying over water, which is barely visible in the foreground. And in the NAPL photos I found of this glacier, that is all ice at the time. This is um, at the top of that glacier terminus, seeing all the crevasses. Um, I used a lot of graphite in these paintings for the first time. And the graphite I used was to represent uh, the soot that is gathering everywhere on ice and is very, very visible. And it became the title Dark Ice of the exhibition, which was softened a bit because, in fact, in many of the scientific reports, it's called black ice. And in some places, it is absolutely black. There is always, of course, darkness in, in the moraines and in the, in the glaciers as the, it scrapes the mountainsides that it goes through. But what you're seeing here scattered on top is soot. Uh, it's from us here in the south. This is another uh, of the Cascawash River, glacier river system. What you see in this braided uh, river is not ice, it's glacial silt, but it comes from the, the glaciers themselves. The same is true in this one where you can see the fresh water on the uh, bottom left and the glacial river with glacial silt showing absolutely white. And that's what it looked like. It looks like ice. Not that the pilots thought it was ice, but it's glacial silt. This is a glacial fan, and I have an NAPL photo of this from 1948. All the fan is white in that early photograph. When I photographed it here, hanging out, uh, there is very little white glacial silt left. I was seeing it with my own eyes, as I, as I had hoped. This is a painting of the tundra in Resolute, which we flew over in a helicopter. And I was so struck by the symbolic uh, shape of the ice remnants. And this was in August. Uh, are they wings? Is it a cross? Has it fallen from the sky? It, it seemed very full of portent somehow. And in the distance, there's a little, little glimmer of the Northwest Passage. This is the remnants of the flow edge uh, caught in Resolute Bay in late summer. And you could walk on some of that ice or jump from uh, chunk to chunk. I did a few paintings of that. In these paintings, in all my paintings, I'm also trying to capture the air itself, the light and feel of the atmosphere, our immersive air-filled space, which we seldom note. This awareness, which I explore with translucent layers in my paintings, has become more critical as the atmosphere that gives us life alters with climate change. In the exhibition Mapping a Cold War, for the first time I created works purely from photographs. And this is a photo mosaic <coughs> of the area uh, focused on Llewellyn Glacier. I'd recorded many ground events and sites not suitable for painting. 
So I created what I called mosaics from many of the ground photos in juxtaposition with the NAPL uh, photos. Those are the small square black and white ones. They're from nine inch contact sheets. And the, they were done on nine inch rolls of film, 400 feet long, nine inches wide that they had to carry in the aircraft. It is extraordinary when you think how we do it so easily now. Um, so I created what I call mosaics from many of the ground photos juxtaposed with NAPL photos. They're pinned up as though temporary, which of course they were for the mapping process. I adapted the idea of mapping mosaics to juxtapose past and present colonizers and colonized the geopolitics and culture of the Arctic that I was observing. This is another um, re a photo mosaic of Resolute. And in it, you see, you'll see a few images from the video heartbeat that is in the next room, which I hope you'll see. The fact they were stretching a polar bear skin as I walked into the hamlet, the first I'd seen since the one I used to nap on all those decades ago, uh, a beating shark's heart, which seemed to speak to the resilience of the people of Resolute, who were part of the high Arctic re re relocation in the 50s. So there is a whole narrative in this mosaic uh, of Resolute over time. And there's a picture of an army captain actually jumping across the ice floe. He didn't fall in. This is uh, a still from the Resolute video. I didn't do any video clips because they're all available next door where they're much easier to see. And they're on my website and uh, accessible there. So this, I, but I started doing a lot of video in, in Resolute, recording extraordinary scenes as I walked around the hamlet and the airbase. These became the video. It's at the very heart of the Arctic, my Arctic work and led to my continuing research on the high Arctic relocation of the 50s when families from northern Quebec, Nukjuak, then Fort Harrison, and Mittematalik, which is Pond Inlet, Nunavut, were moved to the desolate north shore of the Northwest Passage with no provisions for food or shelter. They called themselves accurately human flagpoles, moved there to demonstrate Canadian sovereignty over the Northwest Passage. It was later called by the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples one of the worst human rights violations in the history of Canada. The videos were very revealing of the continuing effects and presence of colonization with the evidence of resilience and resistance all around me and the urgent need for reconciliation. In this image, you see um, two throat singers who were asked to do a demonstration of throat singing to entertain the troops who you see all around them. On the left is um, my friend, Alurik Amarulik, who was a ranger, and she was told she had to do this uh, because she was in the rangers, but she was also uh, from Resolute, and she is throat singing with Selina Kulik, whose mother I later, I later uh, recorded both Alurik and Selina's mother in videos that are next door. This is a, a, a photo of the installation in Calgary of mapping a Cold War. So you see the, th the size of the three uh, photo mosaics that I just showed you two examples of. And um, the two large paintings from the Casco Walsh River system on the far wall. And in the center is this. I made a mapping demo with a stereoscope with uh, the overlapping photographs. I couldn't use this myself because I only use one eye. It takes two eyes to use a stereoscope. Um, the flight line, flight line map facsimiles. And I made a, a mapping mosaic myself. There it is. This is of the Cascawell system. It took me hours to place these photographs in the right uh, location. And at the Rockliffe Photographic Establishment. They did these daily in their thousands to create maps. It would then be re-photographed and sent for topographical uh, development. That's mine. The 
the photo mosaics led to the commission of the mosaic that you see here called Flight Line Erasure by the Ottawa Art Gallery for its opening exhibition in 2018. This time the photos are printed on brushed aluminum which creates the feeling, the fleeting impression that we're moving in time over these images as light catches them. The idea of using aluminum came from aircraft which are made of aluminum and the mosaic is focused on the history of Ottawa and its role through mapping in the colonizing of the Arctic. So I hope one day this will be on view again here. <laughs> These are video stills, which are again shown in the exhibition next door. Um, the first one on top is, they're both taken actually, when I was a little backtracking here, after mapping a Cold War, I was invited to join the Canada C3 X 2017 voyage on the icebreaker Polar Prince, organized by the Students on Ice Foundation in Gatineau for Canada's sesquicentennial celebrations. The icebreaker sailed from Toronto and on to Victoria, sailing Canada's three coasts in 150 days. I was resident artist for the Northwest Passage Lake, starting at the top of Baffin Island in Pond Inlet, sailing through the passage to Resolute and Joe Haven, and disembarking at Cambridge Bay. It was another extraordinary voyage through the Arctic. The works I created at, as artist on board are here in dark ice. I'd always wanted to return to Resolute to record more of the people I'd met there with CPAP, as you saw in the video still with Aloyak and Selina. I was very honored to record Elder Zipporah Kaluk as she reminisced, and you can see a little glimpse of this in the top photo over photos of her childhood in a nomadic camp, Alicevic, near Pond Inlet. She was forced from the camp to the inlet and then to Resolute. And she was nine years old when she went to Resolute. The second video on the bottom records the voice and story of Valeria Amarelik, who I had also met on my CFAP trip. She's the, one of the throat singer in the military uniform, the red ranger's uniform. She's in that video, she's both in the military and entertaining the troops. She was an Inuit participant on the C3, and in this recording, she tells her story as we sail the Northwest Passage. She talks of joining the Rangers as a way of thanking her grandparents for, survive, for sur surviving the hardships of the high Arctic relocation in the 1950s. And my heart still stops when I hear this. As a Southerner, observing and responding to the effects of Southern policies on Inuit lives, I became very aware of my position and sensitive to the role of my own voice in recording theirs. The opportunity to give back, to reciprocate in the spirit of reconciliation, and to contribute to greater settler awareness of the effects of Southern policies in Inuit lives and communities became very critical to me. The three videos shown in Dark Ice are at the heart of my relationship to the Arctic now and to how my thinking, research and work have evolved. I hope you'll take time to view all three videos. They're not very long and they're also on my website. These are some of my travel photos from the C3. The upper image here is of Zipporah in front of her resolute home where I interviewed her. In the lower are Puyat and Asta with their new hockey sticks, gift from the, the C3, taken on the shore of Resolute. Asta is also in Heartbeat, filmed four years earlier. She's a little girl in bright pink everywhere. More images from the C3. In the upper, our small old icebreaker, the C3 Polar Prince, alongside the brand new Canadian Coast Guard icebreaker, the Henry Larson. We were invited on board for a reception, which apparently is part of maritime protocol. It was fascinating. In the lower images, the clouds are hanging over Devon Island, which is an uninhabited place, but was once used as a Mars, Mars simulation site. I guess until they really go to live on Mars. Um, my travel photos again. Um, here is an image of something some of you might have read about, a Fata Morgana. It's a form of mirage in which uh, 
In this case, the ship following us is seen and then its mirage inverted over top. And it's the source of, of stories like the Flying Dutchman. So we saw a lot of mirage. Uh, this was the only true Fata Morgana of an object, isolated object being reversed and seen hanging over the horizon. It was quite, quite a thrill. And on the bottom, uh, a different kind of place. It's um, the Franklin Cemetery on Beachy Island in the Northwest Passage, which some of you might know about. On his first expedition, several of his men died and were buried on Beachy Island. And one of the, I think two or three of them, but the one I remember is John Torrington, whose body was uh, mummified in the ice and found almost intact many years later. I also had in 2018 a residency with artists and writers from around the world on a, the tall ship, the Antigua, sailing around Spitsbergen and Svalbard, which resulted in some of the works here in dark ice, like the, the glacier front is from Svalbard. So this here in the upper photo is Kaya on the bowsprit of the Antigua. He was our Dutch cabin boy. He was 15 years old and allowed by his parents to take a year off to sail the Atlantic. This is one, one of his uh, port voyages on the Antigua. In the lower, uh, my cabin porthole, and this is the midnight sky in June in Svalbard. It's as bright as the noonday sky. And you did put porthole covers up to sleep. <coughs> And this you'll see shortly. It's a panel of eight recreating the calving glacier terminus of Dalbreen in Svalbard. But going back a bit, by this time, living with what I'd recorded in Heartbeat, Sapora, and Aluriak, and the ongoing research of the high Arctic relocation and the Arctic, I knew I could not continue to create work from Inuit land, their lives, and culture as a settler artist looking in from my settler position point, my vantage point of southern settler privilege. Rebecca Bassiano was curator of the exhibition and we talked about a collaborative exhibition with an Inuk artist. Robert Kautik was introduced to us by the editor of Inuit Art Quarterly and we were very happy when he was enthused by the proposal. Robert Kautik's drone and ground photography is very powerful, very beautiful and revealing and a major contribution to his community and to Inuit culture. Rebecca has been able to interweave our distinct bodies of work and create a dialogue between the two in this powerful installation. The exhibition speaks to Robert Kautik's life in Kangagapik, where he works with the Itak Heritage and Research Center with scientists, hunters and trappers, as well as teaching skills to younger people, raising his family and working with cycles of change in his high Arctic home. I'm showing a few images from Dark Ice as a reminder for those who have seen it and a teaser for those who are about to go on the walking tour. So this is one panel of the eight printed on aluminum that make up Dark Ice. And I have to thank Roxanne Lafleur, who's smiling here in the audience, for doing all of the Photoshop work to make this particular piece possible. because. I was walking through the moraine on a slippery, rainy day, trying to stay steady and <laughs> keep the same location across this hole of the glacier front, which you'll see next door in the next slide, and trying to hold my camera steady and not always succeeding. But you wouldn't know it because of the work Roxanne was able to do. I just remember how hard it was, and she remembers from having to fix it. <laughs> so thank you, Roxanne. So this is what I'm talking about, the 30-foot aluminum uh, piece called uh, the ice wall facing dull green, which is a, a retreating glacier in Svalbard. They're all retreating. Svalbard's uh, heating up twice as fast as our own Arctic. And um, the water in front of it is a bay. It didn't used to be a bay, but it receded enough that it was all water. As the 
glacier was calving, big chunks of ice would fall in front of us, which I never quite managed to catch. There's a tiny bit of water splashing in the previous image that Roxanne spotted, but uh, it was just my bad luck with the shutter release, not getting it. Uh, but you couldn't go close because the water would become almost tsunami-like from the calving uh, pieces of ice. So it was quite extraordinary to see and then to capture it again, as I hope I've done here, um, with printing it on aluminum so that as you walk across it, it seems to move with you and the ice seems to change and it, and it shifts and it falls because of the light hitting brushed aluminum. Now these don't help. Uh, you can see fragments of the rest of the installation in the background, but I wanted to show this because I'd, been, I'd shown the, the one single image, but it was to become this whole wall. Uh, okay, this is obviously not next door. It's after the cryogenic Snowball Earth, the title. Uh, it's from 2021. It's the original installation at the Bonavista Biennale uh, where I installed it. This is in Newfoundland. And um, the Ediacaran fossils are 650 million years old and I had photographed them at a place called Mistaken Point, which is now a UNESCO heritage site and you couldn't walk quite as easily as I did back in 2008. Um, but you can walk on a facsimile of it at the, at the ROM, I hear. Um, anyway, uh, it, cel it was to note the, uh, these fossils and the fact that they were the first life forms on Earth after 100 million years of the cryogenian period in which the planet was covered in ice, the entire planet, even the tropics. It, there's a, a, a discussion whether it was solid ice or slushy ice, so some people call it Snowball Earth, and some call it Ice Ball Earth. Anyway, uh, it, it was quite extraordinary to see, and Rebecca and I decided it was appropriate to actually start a climate change exhibition with something from 650 million years ago, and ice, and so, and sorry. Uh, so the surprise is when you go in and see it, that these fossils are now perched on a mock iceberg. But you have to go and see the show to see it. These are banners um, that are printed on uh, very thin, fragile cotton. This selection is called Near. Uh, these are my photos. The two panels on the left are of the ground, except for one uh, of the Northwest Passage. Um, mostly from Beachy Island and the Prince Leopold Bird Sanctuary on the upper, upper left. There are images of fragility, of the, the passage of animals. On the right, there are images from Svalbard, which show uh, a fragile bird's nest, broken eggs, uh, bits of, of lichen and algae left after the reindeer have eaten most of it because uh, that's their food and it's fast disappearing. And these are Robert's images on the back of the banners or the other side, depending on which way you're walking through the exhibition. And as mine were near, his are far, which is appropriate for a drone photographer. And his images are also these sort of left behinds. It's the old settlement of Kangujgapik or Clyde River, and uh, the debris left there and a few hunting cabins when the hamlet was forced to resettle on the other side of the bay. So this is what was left. And I mentioned the light boxes earlier from uh, the um, Hang on, I lost my place here. Okay, yes, so, sorry, I've jumped here. Um, through time and space, this is number four, and it shows the NAPL photo from 1953, taken from several thousand feet up, and my photo of ice in Franklin Strait from the deck of the Polar Prince in 2017. That's the rectangular one on the right. 
it's very hard to see the differences in the two images. And as Heather Gloniotti writes in Frozen in Time, I quote, we think that we're 20,000 feet above climate change, and really it's a 40-foot drop. A very poignant way to think about it. It's more urgent than we realized, unquote. But painting remains a very significant practice for me, as you can see in the Bella Street a straight triptych, which appears very calm, but is not. We are sailing through the dangers of the strait. It's only two kilometers wide, with whirlpools, reversing tides, and currents in uncharted seas into the ice seen on the horizon at the top of the world. This is an installation shot, obviously, of, of the show with images of Roberts on the left, which are the, the icebergs that have flipped, and on the right, uh, views from his drone photographs of ice patterns and shifts uh, in the area around Kangutagapik. So this has been a voyage several voyages over 50 years. I hope I've not exhausted you, perhaps no more than myself, as I put all these years, voyages, and resulting artworks together, <laughs> and hopefully with some insight and coherence along the way. It will eventually be on my website, as well as the Facebook page of the Ottawa Art Gallery. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie, for sharing that with us. So on behalf of everyone, obviously, huge round of applause and thank you, Leslie, for sharing all that information and what a long and incredible career you've had. Really incredible to hear you talk about it. I just wanted to mention, too, that the exhibition will actually be touring through 2024 to at least three locations, um, in a, starting with Iqaluit, uh, Nunavut, and then to Sarnia, Ontario, and then to Winnipeg as well. So it's very exciting. It's going to get some good visibility for the work as well. Um, so uh, the next portion of our evening um, will take place, as I mentioned, in dark ice. And so uh, what we'll do is um, you will leave the doors. You're welcome to leave your coats in the coat check or even leave things here. Um, and you can make your way. Um, those who are interested can make their way over for a more casual conversation time to answer some questions. Right, Leslie? <laughs> She might be exhausted. I don't know. No, I just <laughs> wanted to say that after all those years of teaching, I am really good at throwing my voice and hurting people and uh, hearing questions, even if they're whispered. So please don't be shy. And if the things you want to bring up, we'll do it in the show itself, yeah. which seems more appropriate. Here we've been talking about the works that are next door. And it feels <laughs> a little like an irony that we should be doing this. So I will be happy to answer anything with the works. Perfect. So let's say we'll resume in um, five minutes across the hallway. Thank you again, Leslie.